Well, welcome to Chapter 24. Uh, chapter 24 of this series of lectures covers information very closely aligned with, of course, the content in Chapter 24. So uh, this is probably the one time in the class that I most closely follow a chapter. We did a little bit of that in Chapter 23 as well. Uh, but here, there really are some great figures that don't need a lot of explaining. But we're going to talk about some very, very big issues. So when we think through and remember uh, what we were talking about in the process of evolution, we were talking about change, and we're also talking about how new species form. And that idea, speciation, how species form, is really uh, well worth talking about and is not as simple as you might think because there are many, many circumstances that allow a new species to come along. So you might have remembered that we introduced the aspects of evolution in zoology and we talked about anagenesis and cladogenesis. And I showed you this figure. Now anagenesis on the left side here is just talking about what occurs in a species over time as perhaps a new predators or new prey come into a species life into the ecosystem that it's at or perhaps new disease so there might be change that we don't see such as certain resistance to certain kinds of disease or parasites in any case anagenesis is simply that idea that over time there is a slow and gradual accumulation of change. This is perhaps what most people are thinking about when they're thinking about natural selection. Now over here on cladogenesis, this is what we're really talking about in this chapter, and that is that a species is still going to undergo some change over time, but at some point there might be a population or a part of the original species that somehow branches off and as it branches off and so this is the key part about the biological species concept as it branches off this new population over here is going to accumulate genetic changes so mutations and because it becomes reproductively isolated it no longer shares those mutations with the ancestral population and so as the new accumulation of mutations and new combinations of traits uh, continue to evolve in this group, this population or series of populations, uh, then there becomes a distinct form separate from the ancestral form. And eventually that may become reproductively isolated such that um, there is no exchange of genetic information back here and so it's a separate species. But this can be a gradual process where um, more mutations are accumulated here, but occasionally there's some sharing until finally there may be a complete separation and you get a new species. <clears throat> so when we think about natural selection, we think about all the different aspects of evolutionary theory, we see that evolution has to explain one, how populations simply change over time, and the second is how new species form. Don't forget, of course, that the title of Darwin's book was The Origin of Species. So this is very much what we're going to be talking about now, chapter 24. <clears throat> Here, just helping you to understand some of the word roots. So anagenesis is just a simple species. You could think about this as sharing all of, the, all of the accumulated changes throughout the population. And in clade, we have a branch. And so we have a separation that may, as we'll see, lead to a new species. <clears throat> there are other possibilities. So that's going to be fun to explore here. On a small level, microevolution is uh, this process that leads to this slow accumulation of change. It's something that's occurring at a population level. It's, it's what we spent a lot of time talking about uh, in the prior chapter, chapter 23. And it's pretty much what's going on in one gene pool. Um, Macroevolution now is a much broader perspective. Macroevolution is us looking at the evolution of major groups 
and trying to figure out the forces that are involved there. So, for example, we talked about the evolution of ratites, uh, those sometimes very large ground-dwelling birds like rheas and emus and ostriches and kiwis being one of the small examples. Also the evolution of lungfishes, the evolution of flowering plants, right? So the evolution of tetrapods, so as vertebrates moved on to land. These are all big macroevolutionary ideas. <clears throat> so evolutionary biologists are often asking this question, uh, are there mechanisms, are there aspects of evolutionary change beyond natural selection, and how are they in, involved in macroevolution? So are there any, any other factors? So we're not going to go through all those, but this is a, a big field, and it's always interesting to understand how major evolutionary change might occur in ways that might be separate from natural selection. So, <clears throat> as we talk about speciation, I've already brought up the biological species concept, that idea of reproductive isolation. And again, a reminder, why does that matter on speciation? It matters because if part of a species, if a population or several populations or even a group of individuals become reproductively isolated and stay that way, then that separation, that reproductive isolation, could lead to the formation of a new species. So here's that biological species concept that we talked about, and Dr. Ernst Meyer is the person largely responsible for this idea. So what have we got? And just want to break this apart and remind you because this is essential to what we're going to be talking about in this chapter. A species is a group of potentially interbreeding populations. Let's stop right there. So a species is a group of populations, a group of populations. How, are, how is that group or how are those populations related to each other that forms a species? And the answer is they're interbreeding. So it's a series of populations, and those populations can have genetic exchange between them. So any kinds of new traits that arise in one population can be shared with other populations within a species. And so we have this interbreeding series of populations, and then the next part, and that series of interbreeding populations does not interbreed with other such groups. So it's a series of interbreeding or potentially interbreeding populations that are keeping to themselves genetically. They aren't reproducing on any regular basis. So this is really going to be what we're testing as we're talking about species formation and species concepts. Now, a word of caution and a peek ahead of what we're going to be talking about. Biology is fuzzy. <clears throat> Biology regularly shows us things that don't clearly fall into one category or the other. We looked at fossils that were somewhat intermediate or perhaps mosaics of traits of ancestors and traits of descendants. We looked at Archaeopteryx. We looked at Seymouria. Okay. Tiktaalik, likewise, has traits of tetrapods and also has traits of fish. So, biology is fuzzy. And we said it's this uh, species is this group of populations that is reproductively isolated from other such groups. Well, what if sometimes there's interbreeding? Does that mean, then, that the two things aren't separate species? Um, just how much reproductive isolation? Does it have to be absolute or can, be there, uh, can there be a little bit? And that's what we're going to look at as we go forward because of that fuzzy nature of biology. All right. So these are the points that we were making. <clears throat> So this is an important point, too, which is the gene flow between the populations 
means that in general, if you even look at a species from the physical expression of the genetics, you should notice that a single species has a set of common traits. Now, it may turn out that from some populations to other populations, there's a tendency for one population to be a little bit different. For example, in the spotted salamanders that we have in Illinois and Missouri, there are subtle differences in coloration, even though we think it's a single species. Um, other biologists might come in, by the way, and separate that out. But uh, right now, if we think there's some interbreeding, well, there is a big river, uh, the Mississippi, uh, also the Illinois, along much of, of the state of Illinois, but spotted tend to be in southern Illinois. So there's the Mississippi River that's largely separating Illinois from Missouri. And so one has to wonder how much gene flow there really is between populations of salamanders in southern Illinois and Missouri. Nonetheless, if there is a steady gene flow, that is what's going to keep a species um, appearing very similar because they're sharing so much of their genetics. Now, all kinds of questions as we move forward. Well, what about hybrids in zoos? One of the things that we need to emphasize here is that this reproductive isolation applies to natural populations. So that's an important thing for you to make sure you've, you've gotten your notes. And I don't know that they spend a lot of time in this chapter making this point. We have to talk about natural populations. So if we go out and put and in the wild and collect up animals that never otherwise would see each other in nature and put them together in cages or zoos, might they occasionally hybridize? Sure. That and, and of course that's what, what my example is here. Lions and tigers are not found in the same place on Earth. Tigers tend to be more Asian countries, and lions are African. And so the two normally don't see each other in natural environments. <clears throat> but there are times when you can breed them in captivity, and you get what's variously called a liger. And their traits are that they tend to be even bigger, by the way. It's just kind of an interesting thing. What we're saying is that a lion and a tiger are naturally reproductively isolated because they simply aren't going to find each other to mate. But if you put them in a zoo and put them in the same cage, they might occasionally hybridize. I was just reading um, that in Africa, and maybe you've seen this kind of thing, you might want to look it up because it's a recent report that someone brought in um, a zebra, that was a zebra that otherwise was wild, but for whatever reason sort of took part in a community where they had donkeys. And so it looks like the zebra and the donkey mated and they have a little foal, a small, uh, well, it would be a small donkey, except that its legs look like a zebra. And so it's pretty clear that this was a zebra-donkey hybrid. Well, that's not a natural mating. We, we don't have that going out in the wild. It was because of humans domesticating donkeys that we see that. <clears throat> so what is reproductive isolation? So the biological species says that species are reproductively isolated from other species. But what does that take? Is it like lions and tigers, simply that they aren't found in the same place? Well, give some thought to that. Do we have closely related species ever living next to each other? So think about that. What do we have in Carlinville that's a mammal where we have two species that live very closely? Closely together, including my backyard and the Blackburn College campus. And that would be two kinds of squirrels. We might call them gray squirrels and fox squirrels, or gray squirrels and red squirrels. And yeah, I understand they regularly will hybridize, but they still are distinct species. Okay, So reproductive isolation has got to be more than simply physical separation. 
like lions and tigers. There must be other ways to keep species from interbreeding. And that's what we're going to look at. <clears throat> Hybrids do occasionally happen. When we consider reproductive isolation, and when you take a look at the major figure in chapter 24, you'll see that reproductive isolation can be classified as before or after fertilization. So sometimes we call fertilization produces a zygote, right? So that fertilized egg is a zygote. So sometimes we refer to this as pre-zygotic and post-zygotic barriers. Pre-zygotic means before the formation of a zygote, and post-zygotic, of course, is after we get a zygote, which is a fertilized egg. <clears throat> so pre-zygotic barriers are those that are preventing fertilization. Well, just physical separation, being that two species don't naturally see each other, at least during the reproductive period, they don't naturally see each other, that would be prezygotic. But there are other ways that fertilization is prevented. So here are a list of some of those right now. I'll go back. So this is the big figure in your book. Um, I see it says 10E, but I'm going to guess in the 11E it's probably the same figure number. And I want to introduce you a little bit to this figure to make sure you understand. Here's a mating attempt uh, right here. So there may be ways that uh, mating might be attempted, but there are some problems uh, with that. And then we're going to learn about what some of those problems could be. But this is pre-zygotic barriers. So these are all barriers that are preventing the formation of a zygote. And what we can think about is the fact that, and so we're going to go through these once at a time, but I'm going to go kind of quickly because this is really well spelled out in your textbook. So one might be that the two simply aren't found in the same place. Another interesting way is that they might be found in the same place, but they breed at different times of the year. That's kind of neat. So there are some salamanders, especially in Missouri, that breed in the fall. And there are some that breed in the spring. And they're, very, they're in the same genus. And so they are closely related species. And yet the fact that their timing of reproduction keeps them apart. Here there may be behaviors that are species specific. And so here in the blue-footed boobies, they have a a fun mating ritual that we like to look at. It almost looks silly. A bit of a dance lifting up and down the feet um, and the females judging that. You remember that there was another example of this when we looked at bowerbirds. And I said the bowerbird males had to build these bowers to attract females. So there could be some kind of reproductive uh, behavior, some kind of courtship, that's species-specific. And that species-specific courtship actually itself helps to prevent interspecific hybridization because you have to dance or wiggle or do something in a very specific way as the female's judging this to be sure that that's going to be a suitable partner. Suitable partner is not only the male's fitness then, what I'm saying, is that this checking is also a way to assure that that male is from the right species, that it's from your species. So this behavioral isolation is pretty important. Over here, what we're going to look at is parts. Do the parts fit? Do the parts line up? Um, so what you're looking at are two snails, and if you just really think about this, their shells are coiled in opposite directions. Right? So this one coils to the left, and this one coils to the right. And when the soft animal comes out, it turns out that their reproductive parts don't line up. And that's what they're showing here. So sometimes there can be a problem with the actual copulation. In insects, there's often a, almost a lock and key kind of shape so that specific species, the genitals, like a bad key, will not fit 
and work in a lock or in, in the case of a female. So we can go through each one of these a little bit. <clears throat> There's not too much to, for me to add beyond the book. In this habitat isolation, it's the two species, as it says, uh, rarely will come into contact. And so they're not physically isolated. They simply are, are either timing or where you live in the habitat. And so what we're looking at here as a species of garter snake, and this is the state of Oregon right here. Uh, this is the Columbia River that's coming down, and that's that irregular barrier coming out to the Pacific Ocean. So that would be Washington State here. And for those of you just a little curious, about right here, if you can see my cursor, uh, right here on the Columbia River Gorge, but on the Washington side, it was my study site for my PhD. So I would drive here every month I, for two years, and I drive from way over here in Washington State out here. So this is Southern Oregon. My wife and I had a chance to be here uh, about um, a year and a half ago when we studied with a geologist the volcanoes in this region here in Western Oregon. There actually were some fires and we needed to get to over here in Northern California, about right here, and we were going to just go through California and drive there. But there were so many fires, we had to go farther north here into Oregon and make our way back down there to avoid the fires. And that was during the months of July and August of 2018. In any case, so this is the southwestern corner of Oregon, and you can see that this garter snake is aquatic. Here's a terrestrial version. Notice Thamnophis. This is the genus, and this is the same genus of garter snake that we have around here in Illinois and in the Midwest. Well, this particular garter snake is mostly terrestrial, and here is the range of that terrestrial garter snake throughout much of Oregon here. <clears throat> and here's that corner, southwestern corner of Oregon, where the two overlap. Okay. That's the other range of the aquatic that we just saw. So here we have two species of garter snake whose ranges overlap, and yet they remain reproductively isolated because they one is more likely to be in water and breeding in water and finding mates in water and the other is terrestrial. Moving on to the temporal isolation, temporal meaning timing, timing, So, timing can be, as it says here, it might even be different times of the day. That's interesting. It could be different seasons, and that's what I was describing for a salamander in Missouri that breeds in, in the fall, really breeds in early, early winter, in November and December, versus the other species that tend to breed in February. Or, of course, different years. So there could be a skipping of some years and they don't time that way either. So this is the eastern spotted skunk and you can see uh, mates in late winter and here's where we find that so here we are in Illinois and we do not have the eastern spotted skunk here. Notice uh, that as we go across here okay so uh, Missouri and Kansas and then I hope you know that's Colorado that's Nebraska, that's Wyoming, North and South Dakota, Montana. Okay. So notice that here on the eastern edges of Wyoming and Colorado, we have eastern spotted skunks. Okay. And here's the western spotted skunk, which mates at a different time. And I'm showing you that about Colorado because you can see the Colorado and Wyoming area is the as a big part of the overlap. So the eastern spotted skunk was over here, and this is the western spotted skunk. And right here along the borders, um, here we would have both species occurring, but yet they remain separated. And they remain separated, we think, largely because they mate at these different times. I'm going to go back. So this is the eastern, which mates in late winter. And this is the western, 
that mates in late summer. So that's a big difference in the timing of their mating. So there's the two ranges. So if you follow these edges, these edges right here do show some degrees of overlap. There's a little bit in Texas, um, but mostly that eastern edge of Colorado and Wyoming. South Dakota too, I guess. Um, so there's South Dakota and there's South Dakota right here. So timing is the reproductive barrier here, and that's seasonal timing. Just as a side note, the skunks in Illinois are striped skunks. Well, guys look cute, but boy, oh boy, you don't want to be sprayed by a skunk. Maybe some of you know, or maybe your dogs have been sprayed by a skunk. Interestingly, I don't remember anybody ever telling me that their cat was sprayed by a skunk. So maybe cats are a little wiser to this. All right, behavioral isolation. So this is important courtship rituals, as I said, for the blue-footed booby and maybe other birds. Courtship rituals not only are helping females assess qualities of perhaps the health or the genes of the male, but they also ensure that the mating is between members of the same species. Okay. So we talked about the blue-footed booby already with some detail. Again, the male is auditioning for the female. Interestingly, courtship is really important in spiders too. So spiders, when they meet each other, Well, let me go back. Spiders, when they meet each other, need to send the signal that to the other one that I'm here not to eat you, but I'm here to mate with you. And if you get those signals screwed up, then there's times that somebody gets eaten instead of mating. Uh, you might have had some bad dates in your life, but it probably didn't end with something as horrible as that. Of course, you wouldn't be alive today if that was the case. Um, but normally when bad dates uh, go on, somebody doesn't eat somebody, I hope. <clears throat> but if you're a spider, that can happen. So go back and remember in the movie what females want, what males would do in Zoe, and that's the bower bird. So again, this is very species specific, including what we said for color, so that the male may be decorating only with certain colors. Bird songs just as well, so it's not always just um, the behavior of dancing or like with spiders somehow, movements, uh, but there might also be sound. And in some cases, spiders, I guess, are making sounds just as well. So here you can see eastern and western meadowlarks kept separate. They have different sounds. We're going to learn about two species of frogs. One looks, it's a gray frog. It's the kind of thing that would show up on your deck, maybe, or on the windows in the summertime if it's rainy. And those tree frogs are two species, closely related. We'll learn later. Uh, one is 4N and the other is 2N. We actually think there's a genetic mistake that led to the formation. We're going to talk about this. But in any case, those two species have different mating calls as well. We think that's part of the behavioral isolation. Now, mechanical isolation. So what's going on with mechanical isolation? And this is that lock and key concept with arthropods or things simply not lining up with these snails. So here's where the genital parts don't line up. They're not in the right place because, again, we've got these swirls on the shells going in opposite directions and so the whole anatomy of the animals is reversed and it doesn't line up. So this figures, as it says, is supposed to be showing where the genital openings are. <clears throat> How about gametic isolation? What's that all about? 
And this could be a matter of chemistry. This is the sort of thing that in my developmental biology class that we talk about a little bit. We go through events of fertilization. And it turns out that there are docking mechanisms or chemical interactions, affinities between molecules that help things to progress in a normal fertilization process within a species. So fertilization is a lot more than throwing a dart at an egg. It's a lot more than a sperm sort of getting up a big head of steam and then just plowing into an egg. Um, that isn't how it occurs at all. That's a horrible analogy, and I hope nobody was thinking about it that way. Instead, there are many species-specific molecular interactions. I'm going to say it again because it's really, I don't think they go through this kind of detail in the book. There are many, many species-specific molecular interactions. <clears throat> and if the chemistry isn't right, then the sperm may not dock, the sperm may not attach to the egg, and it, then that sperm, if it does attach, may not trigger the right cascade of chemical events. So in biochemical pathways, usually it's, it's, it can be thought of, especially for me, who I don't like to think of myself as a chemist. I don't think I am in any way. So when I think of a cascade, a biochemical cascade or pathway, I like to think about dominoes that you might line up and you push one and it causes the next to fall. And of course, it's a chain reaction. Well, that chain reaction of chemistry, that biochemical pathway, in fertilization is really important. <clears throat> and people that want to understand how there can be problems with people reproducing understand that there may be problems sometimes with those chemical steps, those chemical uh, reactions. <clears throat> so, here's something kind of interesting. Go way back now into early days of zoology. Holy cow. And you might remember this picture. And I said it was a smoking sponge. This is a sponge that's not smoking, but instead looks like it is because it's releasing so many gametes into the seawater up here that that cloud looks like smoke, but it's really gametes. So a question that nobody at least doesn't usually ask, in fact, I can't recall any Zo student ever asking, is how is it that these eggs or sperm are able to successfully find other eggs and sperm of the same species. I mentioned to you that seawater has eggs and sperm in it floating around. How is it that these eggs and sperm from this sponge are only going to interact to keep the species intact in any case? These, these gametes are only going to interact with other members of the same species. And the answer is chemistry. That's what I just said. <clears throat> so when you, when you toss out your eggs and sperm and, and go and good luck, you, you realize that this is going to be a matter of chemistry to keep those reproductive barriers intact. Same thing is going on with sea urchins. Sea urchins are casting gametes out into the water. And that is, in the whole process of reproduction, that's about as as far apart as you can get, just toss out your gametes and hope that they interact appropriately and create a new generation. Then what we see throughout the spectrum of animals is that there are processes, steps, that species have taken that make it more likely that their eggs and sperm are going to meet eggs and sperm of the same species. And that might be like what is going on in fish where fish are going to congregate like salmon in a stream, and males close to females are going to be dumping their sperm as the female dumps her eggs. So when you think about what's going on with salmon, it helps you to think, okay, well, in both cases, salmon and sea urchins, they're dumping their eggs and sperm out into the water. But salmon are making sure that a male is right next to a female. That's not what's going on here in sea urchins, usually, in sponges. So, the reproductive barrier here is chemistry. All right, 
Well, what happens if somehow uh, two species do hybridize and a zygote is formed and that zygote's viable? Okay, so one possibility is that you can fertilize an egg with a species of another species, uh, with a sperm of another species, and there's no fertilization at all, right? There could be some kind of problem. That's what we said was going on in the seawater. What happens if actually it starts developing? Well, there's three possibilities. One is that whatever develops, um, as it's developing, it, it doesn't, things don't go well. Development, in fact, may stop prematurely, and I'll tell you a research story, uh, somebody that I worked very closely with, my mentor in my undergraduate and master's degree, uh, did a lot of research on this, one of the pioneers of in vitro fertilization in the United States. In any case, it could be that the embryo starts to develop and then stops. Um, I'll give you another quick example just because it's fun. Apparently you can fertilize human eggs with hamster sperm. I'm going to say that again because you might not have thought I said what I said. You can fertilize human eggs with hamster sperm. Or actually, it might be the reverse. You can fertilize hamster eggs with human sperm. In any case, you actually get fertilization to start happening. And we call those little embryos humsters. That's kind of fun. But thank goodness there's reduced hybrid viability and development only occurs through a first, first few stages and then the embryo stops developing. Okay, So this is still preventing hybridization because even if a zygote forms it doesn't go very far. The second possibility is that a hybrid is formed but the fertility is affected. Okay, So you might think about that and think about that being a mule. So we'll look at that in which a donkey and a horse, for, a horse uh, reproduce, and what's, what's produced out of that, a mule, is in fact infertile, or usually infertile. <clears throat> the third possibility is, nope, they're still fertile, but over a few generations, something's going on where the th whole thing starts to break down, and hybrid breakdown is then the last barrier, really, of all of this, which is, yeah, we get some kind of hybrid, and it can even reproduce, but eventually the whole thing doesn't work out. And, of course, there must be other categories, uh, but those are what we're going to explore. So, reduced hybrid viability, and that certainly is the case in salamanders and probably other species. So here you can read this. Must be something that's pivotal, some perhaps intracellular processes that are just not compatible and that unique biochemical um, composition of these different species is, is simply not working. The pathways are somewhere breaking down. Okay. Here's a, such an example. It's kind of interesting and we'll talk about this later. In California, there's this salamander called Encetina. Encetina, and here are different populations of them. And what's really interesting is, from one to the other right here, um, there are reproductive barriers, but there does seem to be some hybridization. But nonetheless, um, there's this breakdown. So. The hybrids between these different populations um, typically break down. I mentioned already um, that some of my, well, I think I'll come back to this. Let's go and look at the mules here. So a male donkey having a baby with a female horse. Not sure if you've realized why that is important, a male donkey and a female horse making a mule. Why do you think it's a male donkey and a female horse? Why isn't it a female donkey and a male horse? Well, because mules are big. 
And if it's a, a female donkey, then she has to give birth to a really big baby. And that may not be possible or healthy or have much uh, success. So we usually want the mule baby to be born in the bigger animal, which would be a horse, a female horse. And so here we have a mule, and people have found over time that mules seem to have certain traits that are good, and sometimes they've used them to pack things in. Uh, so on a trail, we, we encountered in California a place, actually it's, so there's three national parks all in a row from south to north. It's Sequoia National Park, Kings Canyon National Park, and Yosemite National Park. And we were in Kings Canyon, my wife and I. Uh, this was eight years ago, actually. And we got into one part of this national park where uh, the part of the national park was designated as a wilderness area. And in a wilderness area, you can't take any cars or motorbikes, no, no motored vehicles except for emergencies. And if you wanted to go camping out in this wilderness area, they had pack mules, just like this. And they'd put all your camping gear on the pack mules, and they would cart in uh, on the mules all of your camping supplies and things. So you could go and hike in real deeply into the wilderness area, and somebody would deliver all your camping supplies. I thought that was kind of interesting. So, offspring of a male horse, a female donkey, it's called a hyena, and they tend to be smaller. So there's a little comment about them from somebody that has got a website, uh, lovelongears.com. Don't know whether or not that website even still exists. Finally, hybrid breakdown. So I believe that the hybrid corn, for example, that we raise out in our farm fields, um, the hybrids that are produced for all sorts of produce, so whatever fruits and vegetables we might be having that are a result of hybrids, that those seeds that you plant are hybrids that have certain good properties when you raise them. But in some cases, if you save the seeds from what it is you produced and try to plant those, you'll actually see this hybrid breakdown, which is that here we have, um, after some generations, there's a breakdown. All right. What I'd like to tell you about then is my mentor, Dr. Ron Brandon. And this is Dr. Brandon. He's retired now. But in any case, when I was there working with him, he studied these kinds of salamanders, which are related to tiger salamanders, um, also Mexican salamanders, this genus called a mole, a mole salamander. They live, tend to live underground or under logs and things. Uh, these mole salamanders are what's reproducing here at around Carlinville area towards the uh, very last week of February or uh, the first week or two in March, depending on how the weather has been. And then tiger salamanders around in our area will continue to reproduce in March, maybe even into April. And then as transformation occurs, the animals leave the pond, and that may be occurring in June and July. What Dr. Brandon wondered, and the research that he did, was taking all sorts of species in the genus Ambystema and in the laboratory using in vitro fertilization to see what would happen if these two species were able to, to fertilize and create zygotes, how far would they develop? And what he studied was the degree that hybridization would occur and then would you get the, these tests that we've been talking about, would you get fertile adults? And then if there was time, and I don't think we did a lot of this, you could check then to see whether there was hybrid breakdown, which is what we were just talking about. And what Dr. Brandon found was that in many cases there was reduced hybrid viability or reduced hybrid fertile, uh, fertility. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more about that before I, I get on to this last point. So let me stay there. <clears throat> 
Um, the reduced hybrid fertility uh, happened sometimes, but in some cases, and Dr. Brandon was telling me this, that they found that no, it actually looked like the hybrids produced perfectly good fertile adults. But the two species would never see each other in nature. They were reproductively isolated. They were separate species because they occurred in different parts of North America. But when they went to try to publish this paper, one of the reviewers said, well, if there is perfectly good hybridization, then they must be the same species. And what Dr. Brandon was frustrated with was that, no, the fact that they can, under artificial circumstances, produce perfectly good hybrids does not mean they're the same species because they are reproductively isolated by being in different parts of the world. And that, full circle, is our point about lions and tigers. Okay. In any case, uh, just before I got into Dr. Brandon's lab, so in the early 1970s, just before I got there, one of Dr. Brandon's students was Dr. Ed Wortham. And Dr. Ed Wortham became a pioneer of human in vitro fertilization. Having done this work with Dr. Brandon, Dr. Wortham took up a position at a medical school. So you may not know that PhDs can teach at medical schools in fact, I was considered, I was a finalist for a position at a medical school um, for when I had my, my PhD. And I, I didn't progress beyond that because I didn't have big grants and that's what big medical schools want and that's okay. Um, and so I was more interested in teaching. But in any case, Dr. Ed Wortham took up a position at a medical school with a PhD and they were trying to pioneer in the United States in vitro fertilization. And that's where we're going to fertilize a human egg uh, in a glass dish or something, petri dish, in the laboratory bench, not within a real individual, a real human. And Ed Wortham was the first person to pipette sperm over a human egg in North America. So it had been done other parts of the world, but in the United States, Dr. Ed Wortham was the first one to be doing that. And that's pretty darn neat. Yeah. All right, more about hybrid breakdown. So these pioneering techniques uh, with Dr. Brandon was checking to see whether or not there would be uh, some stop in the stages of development or potentially even a hybrid breakdown. So in traditional hybrid breakdown, the first generation hybrids are looking fertile, and Dr. Brandon produced some of these, but he didn't have time to go and check for crosses of those, I don't, I don't believe. In any case, um, here you can see that then what happens to these fertile hybrids? Well, when they mate with another species of the parent species, things tend to start sliding and getting worse. <clears throat> and so here, cultivated rice plants left and right, as it says, initially you're doing fine, but then in the next generation, we wind up with a stunted plant. So there's a hybrid breakdown. All right, so that's all about that figure in your book that's showing all about different types of reproductive isolation. Why does reproductive isolation matter? Well, we said that that applied to the biological species concept. So Dr. Ernst Meyer's idea about the biological species concept was this reproductive isolation. Well, turns out that the biological species concept cannot easily be applied or even practically be applied to all of the situations in biology where we'd like to understand the species boundaries. So let's think about that. Here are places that we can't apply the biological species concept easily in any case. Fossils. How do you know when you find fossil organisms whether or not they're reproductively isolated? If they were reproductively isolated because of their range, well, um, you, you might expect to find fossils in different parts of the world, and, and that would be one good way to separate them. But what if it's behavior? Or what if it's the chemistry between their gametes? Or what if development doesn't continue? 
So it may turn out you find fossils of different species that look closely related. And now you have to ask the question, is this the same species or is it somehow separated, reproductively isolated in ways that we don't know? And of course, asexual organisms. So reproductive isolation is good for species that reproduce sexually, but what about those that don't reproduce sexually, including, as you can see, prokaryotes? So we have some ideas uh, that we need to think about. So here's the question, determining the point at which species are reproductively isolated. Here's a case of a coyote that's known to hybridize with wolves. So these are both wild animals, coyotes and wolves. Some of you know that coyotes will also hybridize with domesticated dogs. Coyotes do hybridize sometimes with wolves. So the fact that they occasionally hybridize, does that mean that they're all the same species? Lucy, come here. Lucy's making noises. I think she's all excited because I'm talking about coyotes and wolves. In any case, the fact that these guys can occasionally hybridize, does that mean then that they're not naturally separate species? And that's the interesting thing. This is the fuzzy thing that I, I told you about when we were getting into this, is that, well, it, it does turn out that they are distinct species, but they will occasionally hybridize. So I don't think we have a good understanding of what are the problems, but it may be that there's some kind of hybrid breakdown, just like we were talking about. And of course, then there's the domesticated dog hybrids. Sometimes, if we're using reproductive isolation, and we're going to return now to this, um, well, this, it's called a, a ring species, in which there's different separate species, sub, well, subspecies or species, as they've been identified now, that are throughout this range. I believe this is up in the Yosemite area right here. These are the Sierra Nevada mountains. Of course, there's California, and that's the Pacific Ocean out here. And when we take a look at these different populations, Biologists have come in and said, nope, these are the different species. And so although there is some hybridization, we said things can break down. Um, and, and that's another example of where it can be difficult to draw the line. So what we've been doing lately, this was more problematic 100 years ago, what we've been doing lately is doing genetic analyses. And we're trying to see how many genetic differences are there between these populations and we're using that as a measure of gene exchange or gene flow. How much is there an exchange of genetic material? And if there are reproductive barriers, then we would expect that those um, genetic differences would start to accumulate. If there are barriers, one type or another, or maybe lots of barriers, we would expect then that these populations identified here by different colors would start becoming genetically distinct. And so then the biologists have to come in, the zoologists, uh, herpetologists really, have to come in and decide, okay, are these genetically distinct populations distinct enough that we think it's a different species or do we call them subspecies? And that's always a problem. So this is the ring species. <clears throat> And I'll give you some time to read this. So this is where I think the genetic analyses help us to, to try to make these calls. All right, now something that I got to experience, got to be part of. Um, this is a, a slimy salamander, and this is a red-legged salamander, and they occur on the same mountain. And what I got to do, and something that I would encourage 
all of you guys to be to, to look into perhaps um, next summer not this summer of course and that is take a field class at a field station so there are field stations uh, many universities have them and these field stations are all across the United States and they're pretty basic facilities but what they are is intended to be a, a fairly organized base upon which then you can go out and study organisms that occur in the wild. And there is a place in western North Carolina called Highlands Highlands Biological Station. And I was able to go there in the summer. I think it was the summer of 1980. And we studied salamanders. And these kinds of salamanders are in great abundance in the Appalachian Mountains. In fact, the Appalachian Mountains is the highest diversity of salamander species anywhere on Earth. So I went there and took a class and I got the privilege of having teachers who were world famous ecologists. And this Dr. Nelson Harston came in, there's Nelson Harston's name right there. And Dr. Harston had been studying the interactions between these two species in a mountain, on a, a single mountain. And the research here that he reports, which is after my class, the research he reports actually involved a little research that I did as part of that class. So he said, uh, here's the range of time that he looked at that, so he used his classes. And what he found was that at the lowest levels, lowest altitudes on this mountain, this is pretty much what we found. We found this speckled, speckled, um, slimy salamander. And then as you moved up the mountain, you started seeing the disappearance of these speckles and the appearance of red legs. And so these are the extremes, speckled on the bottom, red-legged near the top of the mountain, and in between was an intergradation, a very clear hybridization going on with species distinct at either end. And so that was interesting. And then what he was looking at was the areas of overlap where they had hybridization was that area of overlap changing over time. And so he's trying to explain that here. Uh, you can read more about that down here. But nonetheless, what we did, uh, there was a group of us, probably about a dozen of us, and we were in two vans. And so we had an altimeter and we'd start out at the low level, and we'd go. It was at night when these animals are just out on the forest floor. So you have headlamps, and everybody gets out of the van, and we go into the woods right there. Didn't have to go far. And when somebody found one, they'd yell one. Somebody else found another, and they yelled two. And when we had ten of the animals, we'd come back to the van because that would take five minutes, and then we would score them. Uh, and we'd evaluate the salamanders on the degree of speckling or the presence of red legs. And we found this at the bottom, and then we'd use the altimeter, and I think we'd go up maybe a, a 100 meters or so, or maybe 200 meters, and then we'd do the exact same thing again. And so that's what we did that evening. It was really a very wonderful, neat, tidy little experiment. And then we go out again and score it and it was really neat because at the end of the evening we would be up here seeing these red-legged salamanders with no speckles at all. So this is a, a natural hybridization. So are these separate species? Yeah, yeah, we'd say they're separate species, um, but they do hybridize. So stopping here, what have we looked at? We looked at the biological species concept. Uh, we've considered many different types of isolating mechanisms, and we've considered some problems with the biological species concept. That's led other biologists to come up with other definitions of species. And these other concepts, as it says here, are emphasizing what keeps a species a species, what keeps it as a distinct group that is distinct from other species. And so here's another species concept, the morphological species concept, which is simply that a species has certain set traits 
that are distinct from other traits. Truth is, is that I think when most of us are going out in the wild and looking, we can distinguish between a cardinal and a robin based on these morphological traits. Now, we have other ways to know that robins and cardinals are not the same species, but generally, this is what we do. We look and we see and we say, yeah, okay, those are the traits that are characterized by that species. Morphological species concept is useful, and it's a bit of what we used to do before we started using genetic analyses. And of course, you can see it overcomes the problem of asexual species. It's been more subjective, and when genetic analyses now came along in the last 50 years, uh, we've been reclassifying all sorts of species where we find that genetics reveals important differences that the anatomy itself didn't show. And of course, this is the big point. We talked about a problem with the biological species concept as it applies to fossils. Well, here, when you look at fossils and when you look at paleontologists describing new dinosaur species, it is based on this. It's a morphological species concept. Okay. So here we're looking at trilobite diversity. Uh, this is showing you a bit of what that wonderful chart that I had in front of the zoology lab showed you, that at one time here, uh, very early on for life, so that's 524 million years ago, we have uh, the eruption, really, of great diversity of trilobites. And so here we see lots of trilobites, and here's a lineage where people think they know how these are related groups, and then in a few cases with the question marks, it's a little unclear. And we talked about this before. Then at the end of the Devonian, when we, at a period of time when we start seeing the beginnings of amphibians forming, something happened right here at the late Devonian, in which, uh, and obviously it was a mass extinction, in which it killed almost all of the remaining trilobite species except for one group and that made it and persisted here all the way up to about 250 million years ago at the end of the Permian. Well, how do we know that these are different species? How do we know this isn't just one species? And that's close analyses of scientists that are looking at the anatomy. And if you looked closely, at each of these drawings of these different species, they are very distinct, right? There's, there's big distinctions. I mean, take a look at this one over here and just compare it to any of its nearby neighbors. And you can clearly see there's differences in anatomy. The size and the proportions of these segments are radically different. So in all honesty, I think looking at trilobite species is one of the best examples of the morphological species concept. Here, a bit more trilobite diversity. <clears throat> if you make your way to the Field Museum in Chicago, and our ability to go has been hindered in the last couple of years, but you can still go on your own. Of course, now is not a time to go during the shutdown. But nonetheless, they have a wonderful display of real, nicely prepared trilobites, uh, fossils, of course. And it's just wonderful to see. All right, here's another idea. And that's the ecological species concept. Applies, of course, to sexual and asexual. And what it's saying is, is that there are characteristics about a species uh, that hold together about the way that somehow the animal is, or, or organism, could be a plant, is making a living. And so the ecological species concept is much more about what do you do in the real world? And so you'd identify perhaps, let's say, this mouse is, oh, it's the one that tends to eat oat, for example. Oats or various kinds of grasses or seeds like that. And this one over here, he tends to eat more insects, for example. Or its role in the ecosystem is to do something else. It's got relationships with other plants or other animals, and that this one is somehow playing a different role. And so there isn't a lot of intermediate 
isn't a lot of intermediate in what they do in their natural environments. So plants and their pollinators are a good example. It might be that a, you think of a certain species of plant or think of a certain species of insect by how those two interact. So you might think of this plant and the specific type of bee that only pollinates that one plant. And so here you're identifying that species of bee by its role in pollinating that one plant. Okay, so plants and their pollinators can be a way of thinking of different species. Finally, uh, another way to think about things is simply a species is a group that evolves. It's simply the, the smallest group on a cladogram. And because we can put cladograms in classification systems um, here, a species is whatever this group is. So it's an evolving group. Of course, some of these definitions overlap. And so uh, we said this is most likely classified based on, so we we'll quiz you here a little bit, what, class, what type of species concept most likely gave rise to the recognition of these different types of dinosaurs? What what type of species concept was probably used here to come up with these different types of dinosaurs? And I hope you're thinking morphological species concept. Morphological species concept, because we just have the anatomy, the morphology. But here, uh, when we think of the phylogenetic species concept, we're thinking of here in this cladogram the pathway that gives rise to humans. And so humans are a species because they're a very distinct part of this diagram. Again, there's lots of different overlapping ways to think about these things. And that's the end of the first part of what I want to talk about in Chapter 24. So we're going to stop here, keep this a little bit shorter. Uh, it looks like we're at about an uh, hour and eight minutes or so coming up on that. I'll end here, and so I'll have a second lecture, the second part of Chapter 24. Now, chapters 23 and 24 are lecture exam four, the next lecture exam we have here in evolution. And then there will be one additional chapter that we look at. I'll have a lecture over that that has to do with information that will be included on the final. It'll actually be a 50-point exam later. So more about that. So this is the first of two lectures on chapter 24. So I'll see you next on the second part of Chapter 24 Lectures.